Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. You are preparing to hear a message from Elkhorn Baptist Church. And if today's message and ministry blesses you in any way, and you would like to be a part of our ministry, we ask you to give via our website, www.elkhornbc.org. Now, prepare your hearts for a message from the Lord. Good to serve God with you. Um, thank you again for being here. We started a series of sermons last week called Dirty Jobs. Dirty Jobs. Last week we preached on dirty feet. How many of y'all remember that? Dirty feet. Uh, about becoming a foot washer. And this week I titled the sermon Dirty Church. And um, Luke chapter 19 verse 41. I, real quick, I'm going to read this verse to you. We're, the main text is going to come from John chapter 2. So go ahead and turn to John chapter 2. But I want to read to you Luke chapter 19 verse 41. It says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, I want you to listen to this, okay? As Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, he saw Jerusalem, and he wept over it. He cried. He shed tears over it. Why? What made Jesus cry? What broke Jesus' heart? And now when I read that, I wept this week because whatever makes Jesus cry should make you cry. Whatever breaks God's heart should break your heart. And this is the reason why Jesus Christ, when he stood on the hill in Jerusalem, and he looked down, he looked down in the valley, and he saw something. He saw people selling, buying, and trading, and exchanging money inside the church. Now, this is not going to be a popular sermon today, but it's going to be a dirty sermon. <laughs> It's going to be a sermon I really believe that we all need to hear. So Jesus walks inside the temple, inside the temple courtyards, and he walks inside the church, and he done something amazing. He done something that a lot of people that who are really religious don't think about Jesus doing. Jesus showed up at church angry. Now, this was a righteous anger, but he was upset. He was mad. He really was. See, a lot of people look at Jesus as being six foot tall, blonde hair and blue eyes, gentle. But I'm going to tell you, he roars like a lion. I'm going to tell you, there's times he walks into the church and he sees things happening inside the church that should never be going on inside the church. He does. Now, here's what he does. He walks in. He does something crazy, mama. He walks in. He, he grabs the table. He turns it over. He grabs the money out of the religious people's hands and he throws the money on the floor and the money just goes everywhere. And then all of a sudden he says these words that amazes me. This is why I believe in church discipline is that you don't hear about very much anymore. But let me tell you something. There is something called church discipline. There is. How many of you know God still spanks? He sure does. How many of y'all got spanked this week besides me? Good. At least, at least I know you're getting spanked every once in a while. Hallelujah. He done something crazy, Tim. He walked into the church, into the temple. He turns over tables. He looks at the people. And he says, get out. You mean Jesus Christ told people to get out of the church? You mean Jesus Christ walked into a temple, into a house, turned over tables, grabbed the money, threw the money on the floor. He looks at the people and says, get out. Can I tell you this morning, yes, that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. So today, I want to I wanna read something to you out of John chapter 2. If you read on down in Luke 19, that's where God, he threw the, uh, he looked down to the hill of Jerusalem and he wept. But in Luke 19, verse 46, he says, the reason why I did that is because of this. My house, listen to this, my house should be called a house of prayer. Listen to me, my house should be called a house of prayer. This house, Elkhorn Baptist Church, is known for a lot of things. But oh my God, I wish that people could look at our church and say, you know what? I know they're a house of prayer. I know when I'm sick in my bones, you take me to Elkhorn and put me in the center of the church where the cross is at, and they'll lay hands on me, they'll anoint me with oil, and they'll pray over me, and I shall recover, thus saith the Lord. I know that. We shall be called a house of a prayer. John chapter 2, if you there, say amen. Look here in verse 12 through 17. John chapter 2. It says, After this he went down to Capernaum, 
with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men. He found them selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables and exchanging money. They made the house of God into a house of den, a feast. You say, do people do that? Let me tell you something. It's still happening today. So he made a whip. I love this. I'm glad that God's not a sissy. I'm glad he's a God that when he says something, he'll back it up with the authority of God. He said he sat down, in one translation, he sat down and he made a whip out of cords. You say, Brian, what was he going to do? He was going to whip them. Watch this. And he drove them out from the temple area, drove them out of the church, drove them out of that area, both the sheep, the cattle, and he scattered the coins of the money changers and they overturned their tables. Verse 16, to those who sold the doves. See, the doves is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of translations will tell you this, that the doves were in a cage. And here's what God spoke into my heart many years ago. The dove, which represents the Holy Spirit, listen to me, a lot of churches have the Holy Spirit caged up. A lot of churches don't let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. They try to dictate the Holy Spirit. And what I love about Jesus, he said, watch this. The last thing he did, Scott, he walked back into the temple where the doves were at in a cage. He said, release the dove. Release the Holy Ghost. Release the Spirit of God. Let God be God. Amen? Let, let him just be God. Because most churches, most people, whether we like it or not, has made the house of God, they've caged up the dove. They've caged up the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I'm at a church this morning that believes in the Holy Spirit. I'm glad because you know what? If you don't, something's wrong because he dwells in you. He lives in you. He's your comforter. He's your teacher. When you're down, he'll pick you up. God says, I had to leave, but when I left, I sent a comforter. I put a dove in you. Hallelujah. So here's what I want to show you today verses, in verse 17. It says, his disciples remembered this in Isaiah. Listen to this. That it is written. Listen, it is written. You, you highlight this verse. You underline it. Zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your church will consume me. Because I don't need church. Mark it out your Bible then. He's saying the zeal of God in this church should be just rampant and loose and doing what it needs to do. He said, my zeal believes in what I believe in too. I believe in God, and God believes in his church. So I'm going to give you three things Jesus is aware of really quick. We're going to rock and roll. Y'all ready? Say amen. First thing, three things Jesus is aware of. Number one, he's aware of who's present here today. Wow. You know the sad thing about John chapter 2 in this story? The people who were in the temple, they belonged in the temple. <laughs> they belonged there. They belonged in the temple, just like me and you. We belong in the church. That's why it's important, whether you're a guest here today or whoever you are, it is important that you have a connection to a church. Because I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like good old church family. That when you're down and you're sick in your bones, that the church of God will rise up, hallelujah, and take care of its people. There's nothing like say, I belong to Elkhorn Baptist Church. This is my church. This is where I belong. There's nothing like that. That's what he's saying. The zeal of your church shall be in me. Put a fire in me. Here's what, see, the people in the temple, listen to this. We're in the temple. Watch this. God gave me this word, but the spirit of the temple wasn't in them. So in other words, Brother Bob, listen to this. I wrote this down. It's so good. You can be in church. But you don't necessarily have the church in you. There's a lot of people that say, I know Jesus. But they really don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people that go to church, they don't have the church in them. And that's what God keeps telling me is that we're living in such a generation today that we got to be careful. Because I really believe there's a false doctrine going around right here in Campbellsville. That you don't have to do nothing, you can live the way you want to live and everything's okay. That's not what the Lord said. He's the Holy God. See, these people that were in the temple, listen to me, were to assist others. They, they were to help each other get into the presence of God. There should have been music in the atmosphere. There should have been a word of, from, from the Lord in that temple. But when God arrived, he seen a dirty house. So instead of making the house of prayer, 
they made it into a dirty house. See, listen to me. I want you all to write this down. And I want you to make this personal. I have to do God's work in God's spirit. I have to do God's work in God's spirit. Number two. Jesus did, he was aware of who was present. And, and the second thing is, he was aware of why they were present. Why they were present. I really felt the Lord speak to me, and I want to minister on this just for, I want to take a little bit more time on this point right here. Why they were present. See, God knows exactly why you're here today. And I know it's early on a Sunday morning, but God knows exactly why you're here today. One thing that I have found out in 16 years of preaching is there is a difference between preaching and spirit-filled preaching. There is a difference than just grabbing an instrument and getting on stage and singing or spirit-filled singing. There is a difference in, in everything that you do in life. There's a difference in that. See, God knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows your intentions. He knows, he knows why you're here. He knows everything about you that we keep trying to hide. We have a, a, an Adam moment. Adam took a bite of the fruit, and all of a sudden, the first thing he knew, he knew he had messed up. And the first thing he did, he ran from the Lord. He went and hid from the Lord. And God showed up, and he walked through the cool of the garden in the day, and he said these words, Oh, Adam, oh, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was at. But do you realize where you're at today? See, one thing I, I really believe is one thing that's missing in the churches today is conviction. It's conviction. See, that's why I got to tell you the truth this morning. Is that I can't be a man pleaser. I got to please the Lord. I can't preach just an ordinary old sermon to you. Because listen to me, your blood is on my hands. The Bible says that one day, according to Hebrews 13, I will stand before the Lord one day. And I will give an account on how the church has been ran. That's why a pastor should never be ran by people. He should be ran by God. That's why a pastor should stand up and preach the word of God with no reservations, whether it steps on your toes, whether it hurts your feelings or not. Thus saith the Lord. Somebody praise his name. Because God is good and all the time. You can't be ran by man. You've got to be ran by the Lord. Hallelujah. And praise God I'm at a church that allows me to be pastor. Hallelujah. I have to stand on the word of God. I have, I have to preach like it's my last sermon. God may come back today. See, we know that here. But you got him there. There's the decision maker right there. I love what Jesus did. He walked in the temple according to John chapter 2 verse 16. And he reminded the people of something very valuable. And I want to give it to Elkhorn Baptist Church today. He looked at them. And I love what he did. He said his words, this is not your house. This is not your temple. This is not your church. He said, this church, this temple, this house is my father's who art in heaven. And it shall be called a house of prayer. And I just stopped by early on a Sunday morning to remind Brian Keith Rafferty that Elkhorn Baptist Church is not my church. It is the Lord's church. I just stopped by today to remind everybody here today we're here for a purpose and you're here for a reason. You're not here for an hour. You're here for eternity. You're not just taking up time. You're here to praise the Lord today. This is not my church. This is not your church. It's not the deacon's church. Thus saith the Lord. It is God's church. It is a house of prayer. Hallelujah. Hey, if you want, you want your family to shape up, I, pray, I, I know, straighten up your prayer life. You cannot get into the presence of God by just spending five minutes a day with him. Guys, I don't know who lied to y'all, but that's a lie. It's not that, God ha that you have more of God than anybody else does. It's that God has more of you. And the more God has of you, the more time you'll spend with him. I, the statistics go around says that pastor, the average pastor prays 10 to 15 minutes a day. That's why churches are not growing. If the man of God will not pray, then he'll, you'll, you'll, you'll never have a praying church. If the man of God, y'all listen to me just for a moment. If you are a man, you are responsible for your house. You are responsible for your children. Let your children bust daddy on his knees. Hallelujah. Calling out to Jesus Christ. 
in history, it says that the church on Wednesday nights done one thing and one thing only. They prayed. They come together and pray. Lord, you call a prayer meeting in a church today, you'll have five people show up. It's the honest to God's truth. We can look silly all we want to. But I'm telling you the truth. I've been in ministry long enough to know you call a Holy Ghost prayer meeting and five people show up. You say, we're going to pray tonight and people won't show up. Because you know why? I'm going I'm I'm to say something really quick. Nowhere in this scripture did God say my house should be called a house of preaching. Ooh, that hurt my feelings. Because I love to preach. I love to talk about my best friend, Jesus. But nowhere in John chapter 2 will you find where Jesus Christ said, my father's house should be called a house of preaching. Nowhere in this verse will you see that he says, my father's house should be called a house of singing. You won't find that. Listen to me. Y'all want the biggest secret to bless your family, to bless this church, to bless your life, to bless your ministry, to bless everything about you? Be a prayer warrior. Be a prayer warrior. Seek the Lord while you can find him, church. I'm telling you, I'm sounding the alarm this morning. I am on the wall this morning. I am having the beckon calling me this morning. Elkhorn, become a praying church. Hmm. Should be called a house of prayer. Number three. First one, he's aware of who is present. The second one, he's aware of why you're here today. If you're here, just put a check mark beside your name or go to Soul Cafe after this is over or even go to Sunday school. You're here for the wrong reason. You should be here because God woke you up. He's blessed us to have a church that is spirit-filled. He has blessed you this morning to put air in your lungs clothes on your back i know we're so blessed we forget about how blessed we really are but can i remind you this morning if you woke up and you're six feet above the ground you're a blessed man and woman in this house today you can praise his name for that because you are blessed in this house today i know there's a lot going on i know there's a lot going on in your family and at work and all these situations but blessed be the name we i'm calling prayer warriors back let me remind you the third point is jesus is aware of your prayer he is aware of your prayer. He's a what? He's aware of what? Your prayer. Jesus didn't say my house should be called a preaching house, a singing house. He said my house should be called house of prayer. Elkhorn, y'all want to grow? Pray. Just pray. You say, Brian, is it that easy? Watch this. Let me remind you of Acts chapter 2. Y'all ready for this? Some good word right here. Acts chapter 2. Y'all remember this? The day of Pentecost. Everybody goes to the tongues. Let me tell you something. It's not about the tongues. It's about where they was at when it happened. This is when the church was first birthed, Lauren. This is when God said, upon this rock, upon this Petros, I'm going to build my church, and Holly, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, against my people. Let me tell you how it happened. Y'all ready for this? It's amazing. They gathered in the upper room, and they stayed. The Bible said they stayed for 50 days. You say, Brian, I got to go to work. They did too. You say, Brian, how do they have Pentecost? Let me just go ahead and tell you real quick. You read your Bible. They gathered. They was in one place. One place. Nobody left. One place. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, <laughs> they started praying. And I'm telling you, the 49th day went by, the 48th, the 47th, and a lot of people may want to leave. But here's what happened on the 50th day. The Bible says that the church was birthed through a prayer meeting. Listen to me. The Bible says that the day of Pentecost, when there was an up, one upper room, the church, the church of Jerusalem, God's church, the house shall be built upon the house of prayer. They started praying, hallelujah. The walls started shaking, the spirit fell, and guess what happened? 3,000 souls got saved that day. I declare today a great awakening. I declare today a good old Holy Ghost Pentecost again. I declare today 3,000 souls get saved again. 
Lord touches one more time. You say, Brian, do you think it can happen? If I didn't, I wouldn't be your pastor this morning. Yes, it can happen, but you got to pray. Let me remind you of Acts chapter 16. <laughs> Paul and Silas, they were in war jail. What did they start doing, Chris? They, start, they were locked up, chained up, bound up, doors shut up. All of a sudden, everybody was saying, I can't believe Paul and Silas is here. And Paul and Silas said, don't worry about us. We, we got a key to the door. It's called prayer. <laughs> All we got to do is start praying and singing God's praises. And the Spirit of God will fall, and the locked doors will come open, and great things will start happening. I'm telling you today, if you're locked up, bound up, chained up, just start praying up, because you'll get out. Hallelujah. Whoa, I preached myself happy at 8 o'clock. I ain't backing off because it's 8 o'clock. I feel better now than I did when I first walked in. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is this. If you've got as much of God as you want. What I'm trying to tell you is key. Prayer is the key that opens the windows of heaven. What I'm trying to tell you guys today, prayer disarms the enemy. What I'm trying to tell us today, we know this, we know this, we know this. But we just don't do this. I want you to write down... I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to fill in the blank. If you had to just guess how many minutes or how many hours a day you pray, I want you to write it down. How often do you pray? When you're in trouble? Most people do. When things ain't looking good? That's when people really start praying. You want to see a praying mom or praying daddy? You let a bad situation happen to their family, and then all of a sudden they'll arise and say, man, this is how you pray. See, the Bible says there's many ways to pray, but what I'm trying to tell you and I today is that God says just pray. And watch this. There's no correct way in praying. You could be like Matthew chapter 6 when the Pharisees stood out in the, in the yard and the center have using all these big $10 words. And all of a sudden, Jesus showed them. He said, what are you doing? He said, oh, we're praying. We're praying. This is all. Thus saith the Lord. And God says, you've got your reward. Because what they were trying to do was impress people with the words. What they were trying to do was impress people how intellectual they were. God does not care how intellectual you are. You will never arrive to the mind of Jesus Christ until you get to heaven. That's why we need him here on earth. And that's why God has you and I here as his messengers to give people hope. To give people hope. Praise team, you'll come. Listen to me. A lot of churches are about making plans and having ideas. And I want y'all to let this get in your spirit. I know you got to have plans. I know you got to have ideas. I know you got to have visions. But God really convicted me on this. Listen to me. We don't need more plans. We don't need more programs. Hallelujah. We've got enough programs in this church to save Campbellsville, Greene County, Adair County, Lebanon. We, we've got the programs. But I'm telling you what churches need and what Elkhorn need is to be a house of prayer. We must come back and get on our knees and pray. Not because you're sick, not because your body's hurting, not because you've got bad things going on in church. We just pray because we are the church. Hallelujah. I just pray because I got a relationship. I talk to Dana because I'm married to her. I got a relationship with her. Watch this. I am, I am married to God. Maybe that's the problem with the church. We've been, we're just dating God. Maybe you need to quit stop dating him and start marrying him. Have a relationship with him. Well, guys, when you talk to him, you can feel him. The Bible says seven times in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying. What's God saying right now to you? Or is a good spirit? How often are you praying? Why are you here? Well, yeah, God knows you're here, but why are you here? How often are you praying? If we're going to reach the youth, and here in just a moment, your next service, that that section will be full. If we're going to reach this generation, listen, we got to quit talking about our president and start praying for our president. That's what God just keeps convicting me. I talk about, I've dogged him. I have dogged him and dogged him. Guess what? I still dog him a lot. But that's not changing anything. Prayer 
here's what changes things. It's my conviction this morning. I can sit and talk about all the things that's wrong with Elkhorn Baptist Church. And we're an imperfect church because we're imperfect people. But hallelujah, there's some great things going on too at Elkhorn Baptist Church. And I choose the goodness and the righteousness and the good things that are happening. And God's changing your pastor. It's hard to even say. But instead of talking about people, let's pray for people. Instead of looking at the negative, let's look at the positive. And I promise you, things will change. So guys, if you would, this altar's open. I don't know how often you pray. Man, you just may want to grab your wife by the hand. You may want to grab your friend by the hand. You just may want to come to this altar and say, God, I don't pray near enough. Man, I don't pray near enough. And you know what? None of us do. <laughs> None of us do. I got so convicted this week. Ron Hoffman, do you pray? You know when I can really pray? When something really bad happens. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because y'all are just like me. I want to learn. Oh, listen to this. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Aaron, go with us there. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Look at this. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Let me revise. Listen. Find a certain place in your life that you meet God every day. Find a certain place that you meet God every day. Watch this. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, this is amazing. His disciples said this, Lord, teach us to pray. Are you serious? Today, you just want to say, God, teach me how to pray. How do you pray? That's a great question for you and God. This altar is open. I love you guys. Man, y'all were awesome today. If you would, stand to your feet. This altar is open. You may just want to come and say, God, teach me to pray. Teach me, God, how to be in your spirit. Teach me, Lord.